Hi there, everyone. Um, perhaps some of you may not know exactly what anthropologists do, but um, you'll see kind of throughout my presentation that I explore not only historical archives on a place, the maps, the photographs, the text based on the history of a place, but I incorporate that two with what people have told me. Um, so I have done a, a bit of work in the bilabatry area, um, and, and you, you, don't, you don't string it out. It's not Bayou Labatry, it's Bilabatry. Um, so just to give you a sense of that, I started in uh, 2004 um, with some work that I was doing through the University of South Alabama. And from that point, I came again after Hurricane Katrina um, and documented houses across Bile Battery that were scheduled for demolition. Um, and then I came again after the Gulf oil spill, and I delved even further into the history of Bilabatri and learned about the connections, not just, um, uh, well, not just the history of Bilabatri. It's not insular. It's not its own place uh, and, and isolated. There are all these other communities in that vicinity, and you'll see throughout this presentation um, what I mean by that. And I changed the title just a little bit, Exploring Forces of Change in, sorry, <laughs> that's not what I wanted to do. Exploring Forces of Change in Bilabatry was originally my title, but as I developed this, I saw that we, we also see a lot of continuity. So for those of you who aren't familiar geographically where Bilabatry is, we're talking about extreme southern Alabama. We're talking about extreme southern Mobile County, but north of Dauphin Island, if you're familiar with that area. So, um, you know, th this is Bilabatry here. Here's the city of Mobile, just for reference. And Bilabatry is not just a commercial fishing community. It comes out of subsistence roots. So roots of fishing for the sustenance of one's family. It's also, um, incidentally, along the northern shores of the Mississippi Sound, rather than right on the Gulf. So it's in the inland waterways. You can't understand Bilabatry without looking at the neighboring fishing communities. And perhaps you weren't familiar with these other communities. But once you get on the ground there, you realize that there's all of these connections. Um, so we have Bilabatry and we have neighboring Codin. Uh, very connected uh, histories there. And then there's West Fowl River um, West Fowl River sits on the river, West Fowl River. Heron Bay sits on the bay, Heron Bay. Alabama Port had an early history of some port activity right there because of its location near the mouth of Mobile Bay. So it's known as Alabama Port. And then you have Dauphin Island. Perhaps you, you weren't familiar with the fishing community of Dauphin Island. A lot of people know about Dauphin Island for the beaches and the fort and all of that. Um, but there is an existing fishing community and it was the, the foundation of the population there in, I mean, sorry, Dauphin Island. But we can't forget fishing communities on the eastern shore of Mobile Bay. We have Bon Secure. Maybe you've heard that as Bon Secure but the people call it Bon Secure. Oyster Bay, Bon Secure, by the way, on the Bon Secure River, Oyster Bay on Oyster Bay. I have a little typo there. I should have said just Lagoon. They're on the northern shores of Little Lagoon. You maybe didn't know that Orange Beach had a traditional fishing community core, but it does. Less connections with these other areas, just separation from the waters, you know, that way. But actually, people from Lagoon settled 
Orange Beach. And I want to make a, a point about these being now, you know, populated by people who work in commercial fishing, but again, based in subsistence fishing. People who are commercial fishers are very often generational fishers. It goes way back in their family. So early on in the history of bilabatry, we have um, the, the explorations, the French explorations that came to Dauphin Island. Around 1698, folks, French folks started coming into the Mobile Bay area and exploring around. They, they made a little settlement um, here at Dauphin Island. They built warehouses um, to put supplies in to fuel their, their explorations. And then once the uh, settlement of Mobile was established up the Mobile River, uh, this became sort of like a supply post for the early settlement of Mobile. Um, by the way, north of Mobile proper and around Creola area. Um, and, and so a settlement itself sprung up on Dauphin Island um, of, of French descended folks. Um, there were also a lot of native people around who were taking advantage of the seafood resources and the waterways there. Um, and eventually some of the French folks came to marry some of the native folks. Um, and, and actually people in Bilabatry today recognize native ancestry in their own families going back four or five generations. So I believe that some of that indigenous knowledge from the native people in that area were passed on in these communities. In Bialabatri um, specifically, we see two early um, settlements and associated land claims that went with them. Uh, this area here on, along the eastern banks of the waterway known as Bialabatri and also along the western banks of the waterway known as Coden Bayou. A French family moved from Dauphin Island in 1726 to establish a plantation there. So they were ready to move on from Dauphin Island and you know, start setting foot. And it's, uh, it's significant that they were along Portersville Bay. You know, They, they wanted that kind of, of water, but they also wanted the bayous. They, they wanted to position themselves in those places that um, maybe w gave them secure mooring, things like that. Um, then in 1786, the claim was made by Joseph Bosage, who was kind of recognized as the father of Bilabatri. Um, if you're familiar with family names in the community, Bosarge, B-O-S-A-R-G-E, is very prominent they traced their ancestry back to Joseph Passage. And he came to Bilabatri in the land claim, it states, that he came to fish and plant corn for the maintenance of his family. So fishing, subsistence fishing, you know, was recognized from that early period. By around 1890, uh, Bilabatri and Codin had been um, had been pretty well settled, um, primarily by French descended people. If you look at the surnames, you'll see that. And this is a hand drawn map. I don't know exactly if it was drawn in that early period. I believe it was probably drawn by an older person later in in the 20th century, but depicting that time period. Um, and so people were settled along the waterways, the bayou, 
and tributaries of the bayou. This is Codem Bayou, same thing. Everyone positioned themselves that way. That's not necessarily, you know, the way every community uh, positions itself. Incidentally, I think it's interesting to point out, if, if you look at the family names, a lot of those same families live in those spots in Bailabatry. They're little family concentrations, and they continue. So, the people of Bailabatry and Codin and all of those fishing communities in that area have uh, what I call indigenous-like connections um, with water. Very similar to what we see with Native Americans, their, their connections and understandings about the natural world um, are, are things that people in Bailabatry also have. From that generational knowledge that is passed down, you know, to them through their grandfather, their uncles, and that information came from the people before them. Um, and so they, they utilize place names that harken back to the French period, place names that in some cases have changed on modern maps. So when they're out on the water, they look and, and they know that, you know, that's Point of Pines. They use that as a navigational aid. And they don't call it Pine Point like some people might. It's Point of Pines because, you know, that's how they were taught. Um, and so the, the knowledge not only um, of navigating these waters, but there's knowledge, too, of how the tides affect certain areas in the water, how hurricanes, depending on the way that they come up toward Mobile, Mobile the, um, you know, the, that direction tells them how it might affect the seafood resources within the waters. So they can predict it as a storm comes along. Um, they also have place names for water bottoms. You know, there's certain places in the water that are named something different. That suggests a pretty deep knowledge about that, that waterway. So if the first 100 years seemed sort of a, a lot of continuity, I, I agree. Um, there was a, that, that continuation from the, the native um, uh, experience of the waterway and the passing of the knowledge um, into the French descended community. Um, so there was a lot, a lot of the same. But the next 100 years reflects a lot of change. So from those subsistence routes, we see commercial fishing suddenly in the 1890s becoming a very viable uh, way of life for people. And um, so we did have some of those folks settled in Bailabatry and Codin, but we also had transient fishing families that were traveling between the Biloxi area and the Mobile area to harvest seafood resources. And I'd say at that time the city of Mobile probably had plenty of processing going on, but it wasn't as accessible, you know, from these southern places to get up to Mobile. There weren't there weren't, there wasn't the infrastructure at that time. Um, it was more accessible for people to come from the Biloxi area to harvest. And so some of the early processing plants in Biloxi were sending out oyster barges into the Alabama waters to harvest Alabama oysters primarily. I've, <clears throat> I've talked to people in the Bailabatry area who trace that back in their own family and talk about the family loading everything up on a schooner and going over to Alabama when oystering was going on there. Um, and so it, it was a way of life for many people. <clears throat> 
But a couple of things in the 1890s in Alabama changed that. In 1891, there was a law passed that said that Alabama oysters could not be exported out of state. So, and then we had in 1899, a rail line that was put into place between Mobile and Bailabatry. And so there, therefore, there was a way to start to move these seafood resources in a way that, you know, they could, they could last out the travel. Um, and so several canning factories were, were established in the Bailabatry area. The Alabama Canning Company, which this picture depicts, um, it was actually over by um, Alabama Port. Um, so it was on Mobile Bay. Then in Bailabatry, we have the Dunbar and Ducate, or the D&D &D factory, um, that began to buy the resources from the Alabama waters. Um, and those transient fishing families started to settle down. You know, so they joined the community of Bailabatry and they also, in large part, started to form some of those other fishing communities to the east. Prior to this, the transient people, as they stayed in Alabama, were, were camping out in like marshes and things north of the bays that they would hit in the morning on their boat. Um, and so those folks started to kind of move up just slightly inland and, and establish permanent homes. And Bailabatry became the central place for Alabama fishing. So fishermen from as far as Bon Secure over on the other side of the bay uh, would, would come over and sell their seafood in, in the bayou. But even though we see this commercialization, this change from subsistence to getting heart, you know, seafood for selling on the market, we see in this area that traditional practices were still strong. Oyster catchers and shrimpers, they knew exactly the waterways to go at, at certain times of year. So they still drew on their own traditional generational knowledge to do that. Young fishers still went out with their older relatives to learn the trades and to learn how to navigate under the uh, you know, these, these traditional navigational ways of doing it, um, which, you know, is very particular. And also understanding those waterways at a finite detail. Um, and communities, those small fishing communities, were intermarrying um, and fishing together. So what did fishing together out on the water look like? Well, I found this 1912 Mobile Register article that really gives us an interesting window into that time period. Um, so these orange places are the oyster resources that were mapped at the time of this particular map. Um, and this area here is known as Cedar Point Reef. You may have heard of it. The fishermen of these areas, they don't really call that Cedar Point Reef. They, they call it by all the little mine, uh, minute spots on that reef. There's different names for all of those locations. There's probably different qualities to the oysters. There's different ways that the water's running over them, et cetera. They talk about them in terms of patty shoals and pass a sweet. It's not Cedar Point Reef. Um, but, but this article is pretty cool to give us a, a window into that time period. So most of the people engaged in the business of catching oysters for a livelihood have been at it all their lives. And in most cases, their families for several generations have been oystermen. They were raised up to the life and know it from their childhood. And then we get a description of the boats. 
As the boat approaches the reef to which the oysterman is on his way, he's not alone. About him, as far as his eye can reach, he will see through the half-daylight white sails flung in the breeze when the morning breaks about him in all directions will be anchored his neighbor's boats. And so because they were out there fishing so close by, you know, they talked. They, they grew relationships. Um, you know, they might have invited people over to such and such, and it led to a marriage. They learned from each other. They shared their generational knowledge with other families, and, and it grew the knowledge of everyone. Those relationships are significant. The, and, and then this article goes on to describe that the work of the Tongi and the oysters will continue until late in the afternoon when a motorboat appears on the horizon. She's sent out from the canning factory to buy a load of oysters from the Tongers. So to me, finding this article was like gelling everything I had heard from people, you know? It's a generational practice. There's all these relationships that are developed on the water. And there's a tie to, to the market. So um, we have all of that traditional stuff going on despite the commercialization and fleet shrimping comes along. So up to this point, Many of the fishers, they maintained their own boats, boats that they probably built. built. Um, probably their friends and neighbors potentially helped them build that. They learned the skill from their grandparents and, and all of that. Um, but they had those boats themselves. They owned them. And in the 1940s and 50s, a lot of companies in the bayou came to have company owned fleets and so people gave up their independent livelihoods for these uh, for to operate a, a company boat um, and specialization started to happen up to this point the the fishers of this area pretty much all of them were oystering crabbing fishing and shrimping it was a seasonal thing they would switch the harvest based on the time of year. Um, and um, at this time, a lot of people decided that full-time shrimping was, was a viable thing to do. Um, other people started to specialize in um, boat building. That another thing that had been a traditional skill that pretty much everyone had, some people decided to specialize in that. Same with net making. Um, so, so you see people kind of trading out that traditional seasonal thing and knowing the entire, you know, round, um, all of the aspects of fishing. But still, but still tradition holds strong in, in the bayou and in, in Alabama, uh, on the Alabama coast. Um, the fleet shrimpers, they would anchor up together during storms or uh, at night because there was no such thing as, as night shrimping. They didn't keep going until they couldn't stop. They stopped at night and they came together and they, and they grew those social relations like they had out on the oyster reefs. They all anchored up together. And very interestingly to me, there were some specific places for that to happen. There wasn't just one place along Mobile Bay that the shrimpers gathered. Um, there was Weeks Bay, which is also known as the, the mouth of Fish River. In fact, the fishermen, can, they call it that. It's not a bay, per se. At this point, on um, East Fowl River, and about here, on the northern shores of Dauphin Island. Um, that place is called Billy Goat Hole. Um, apparently there were some goats hanging out there at some point, and so, it, you know, hence the name. Um, there was some er an early folklorist who came to the bayou in the 40s and 50s who described, well described, what went on um, 
uh, in on Weeks Bay when when people would come together. Um, but I heard from someone out of the bayou tell me about his time at Billy Goat Hole. So I wanted to just give you that that little quote I have. Not only us. But about 10 other boats would come in there and anchor up in Billy Goat Hole. And all of us young boys and old men, everybody would get together and tell fish stories and shrimp stories and cook their main recipe. I'd cook shrimp gumbo. You pretty much ate out of the water. You pretty, sometimes you might even luck up and have oyster and potatoes in, in case somebody happened to get some oysters when they were out shrimping. Everybody's, everybody bring their uh, loaf of bread and come on. So it was that camaraderie um, that still happened out on the waterways despite the commercialization. People still stuck together. They still learned from each other. And even though there was some specialization, some people maintained the seasonal harvest. And I've, I've met people who do that now, who still maintain the different boats that they made for all of the different seafood harvests that they do. Um, and, you know, that maintains kind of a different, a different mindset for people. And, and they're more, they're doing it more like their fathers did. So that traditional sense really was strong in the 1950s and an event in around 1956. The Alabama Department of Conservation Seafood Resources Division, now called the Marine Resources Division, um, they had a policy to sell dead oyster shell to companies to process into lime for things like concrete and chicken feed. Well, when, when the oyster catchers, you know, got wind of, of this practice, they weren't happy about it. So this is one of the only times I've been able to find in the history of that, of these fishing communities where, where the fishermen stood up like this. They were enraged, sometimes up in arms. They boarded these oyster barges that were out there dredging the reefs, um, sometimes with guns. Um, other people would trail the oyster barge and start tonging oysters behind them to show these weren't dead oysters. They were live. The fishermen testified, too, that that was the case. And they also told about these being, right here, the mother reefs. They were the mother reefs of the Mobile Bay oysters. The spawn would come down and populate these other reefs, including the massive Cedar Point Reef. They knew that. They knew that. It shows their knowledge Shows their knowledge um, and the fact that they were they were willing to stand up like that and kind of get out of their normal realm and and say this is not right. Unfortunately, they lost to the company in in uh, court cases that followed from that. Um, but fortunately, that policy ended around 1982 from the Marine Resources Division. Um, but it probably had quite a detrimental effect on the oyster reefs in Mobile Bay. And you know, a lot of a lot of fishermen will tell you they're not they're not the same. They're not the same as they used to be. So then in the mid 1980s, we see a downturn in commercial seafood for a number a number of reasons. Um, there was an increased number of fishers around this time. Asian immigrants started coming into Bailabatry, so the numbers of fishers grew at that time in part from that. Um, and there also came to be 
um, turtle excluder device requirements. So on shrimp nets, they now have to include these things that they refer to as TEDs, the turtle excluder device that is intended to let turtles that you catch in the net go free. Well, in addition to letting out the turtles, they let out the shrimp too. And so there's a decreased catch um, from nets that have the TEDs on them. You know, and ironically, from the fisherman's point of view, um, they very rarely caught a turtle, you know. And so it's, it's like, that, even though there wasn't to them a real issue and concern. Um, then there's high boat and insurance costs that came into play. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about technology change, but there was a point, you know, um, around the 1970s when people were trading out their ice boats for freezer boats. Um, so in, instead of, you know, having ice in the hole to keep the shrimp, they had freezers to keep it. And, and they also were, you know, getting these huge gulf boats to be able to shrimp out in the gulf for longer and longer periods of time. And so high boat mortgages came with that. And then we get the decreased value of shrimp. And this actually feeds into this next thing where that downturn alters the working waterfront. Um, a working waterfront that had been completely um, engaged in supporting local seafood harvest and processing um, to where these, these issues going on led the processors to have to purchase more and more Asian imports. Shrimp that are farmed in ponds in parts of Asia and then shipped over here. Um, and, and, you know, to keep afloat, they had to do that because there were less and less local shrimp. And then that cyclically went back to impact the local shrimpers. Um, and also, at that time, a lot of the, the people who had specialized in fishing boat building changed over to the oil and gas industry. There were increasing amounts of rigs out in the Gulf that needed supply boats, crew boats, etc. So, again, the boat builders on the bayou and on Coden Bayou switched over to oil and gas in large part. This stuff was complicated by recent disasters. Um, I touched on a little bit about, you know, after Katrina, about half of the, the homes in Bila Battery were condemned and torn down. And that meant a lot of people moved north. They went away from the waterways that had been so central and away from the processing plants where, um, you know, a lot of folks had work. Um, and this actually uh, specifically seemed to impact the Asian populations in this area because they had in large part come into areas that the generational folks had vacated because it flooded all the time. You know? So they had come into those areas, and then they were flooded again with Katrina, and um, a lot of the Asian population had to move north. Um, and a lot of Asian folks in Bila Battery don't have cars, and they work in the processing plants, and they have their own boats. So um, that, that has probably, I, I haven't explored that since then as much, but I am imagining that it has, um, you know, had quite an impact on the Asian population. And then with the Gulf oil spill, you know, it shut down fishing, um, but there was work for people who could operate boats out in the Gulf. So, you know, fishermen were at a good advantage with that, and they were out there rounding up the oil and burning it. I mean, I heard stories from Mobile area all the way over to Carabelle, Florida, about this stuff. Um, they, uh, they were rounding it up and burning it, and they said that was getting rid of it, and then came the dispersant. And the dispersant sunk it. 
So not only did they lose their work in that disaster, but then they were left with a legacy of what's going to happen with future storms. There's a lot of fear of that out there um, from people who know these waterways. So is there hope for the future? You know, I don't want to leave on a bad note. <laughs> and I think there is. I really do think there is. The bayou is still a central place for Alabama fishing communities. And it's still a central place for people across the Gulf Coast to engage in fishing. The, the bayou is a stopping place. They come, they get supplies to keep them going out on the Gulf. And, and that is alive and well, you know, to a, a little bit less degree because of those switchovers that we've seen to the oil and gas. The Asian Americans um, who are now in the community, and we're talking about Vietnamese, Cambodian, Laotian, and Thai people, they have a wonderful work ethic and um, are, are hard working out on their own boats and in the processing plants. And so some of the processing processors, the, the owners of those companies recognize that um, the Asian people have actually infused something into their, into their business that has allowed it to keep going. Um, and then, you know, for me, there's, there's hope because of, of the fishermen's understanding of these waterways and the focus on sustainability. Remember the indigenous tie there? Anyone who's relying on natural resources and the direct harvest of those typically doesn't want that to go away. And that's the case for the fishermen of the Alabama coast. Um, they, they want that to keep going and traditionally had all sorts of practices to do that. For example, oystermen who were harvesting on one point of a reef, as they moved their boat over to another, they would call out the smaller oysters and throw them over the, the side into the water. So they were expanding the reef all the time. Those things actually have been regulated out. So, so to me, these qualities, this knowledge, this traditional generational knowledge that people have of those waterways is becoming critical as we approach questions of coastal resiliency and climate change and increasing storms, the intensity of storms that are coming in. These things are being seen by the scientists looking at them. And we have a great movement of, you know, trying to pr promote coastal resilience. The federal government is funding all sorts of things for that. Um, but I feel like it's leaving out the people like those of Bailabatri and frankly other traditional communities. It's not just a fishing community that has knowledge of the environment, you know, but those who have that direct harvest, that direct connection and relationship with the natural resources. They have an understanding about the environment that we don't have, that many of us don't have. And so those things give me hope if we can tap them. Um, so, you know, my thoughts for moving on out of this talk is to demand local seafood. Let's keep these fishing communities alive. Don't eat the Asian imports, you know. They're in your grocery stores, but so are the local, the, the, the more local seafood um, is also in your grocery store, most likely. It's in mine. Um, and so we need to, as consumers, demand that. And we also need to support commercial fishing. 
I don't know if you're familiar with um, fights between recreational fishers and commercial fishers, but often commercial fishermen are are blamed for you know the over harvest and the in 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 issues within the fisheries. But when you look at the numbers and the fact that commercial fishers are highly regulated, whereas recreational are not as much, there's not as many commercial fishermen either as recreational. So I say support commercial fishing on the ballot, you know, as, as issues come up like that. Um, because it's not just a this is good for the environment thing. We got to think about how it's good for us. And communities like this help humans go forward. It's what we all came from. Fortunately, there's not just Bahala Battery and Bon Secure and all those other smaller fish, uh, fishing communities. Um, during that oil spill work um, within the company I'm with now, we we recorded traditional communities from this point here, Terrebonne Bay um, in Louisiana, all the way over to Carabelle, Florida. And these yellow dots represent the traditional communities um, that we documented, and we documented properties, uh, traditional cultural properties with them. Um, so a lot of, there's, there's more than just pile of battery is what I'm saying. There's people out there who know something that that, that science doesn't know. Well, my sense in talking with commercial fishermen in Alabama, um, all of those people also do the subsistence or sustenance fishing that you're describing. Um, it, it's, it's not just uh, an occupation for folks. Yeah, I don't know. That would be interesting. You know, up and down the causeway, uh, there's folks who do that. Um, and, and really up and down the, the bay. Um, it's true. It's an interesting question. I'm sure there's quite a lot of people who have to rely on that. I'm like the the, the taste of the seafood. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, I can say that um, you know, in speaking with commercial fishermen about the Asian imports versus the local shrimp, um, you know, there's they they insist that Asian shrimp, you know, is rubbery and almost tasteless and. Um, I, I imagine that, you know, if we focused on that ourselves as we were tasting these things, we'd, we'd agree with that. Um, I mean, I actually live in the mountains of North Carolina now, um, but and I really don't eat seafood until I come to the coast, you know. 
the Alabama coast, the South Carolina coast, whatever, wherever that is, I'm looking for the local seafood. And that's what I do, you know. When I when I go to restaurants, I um, I ask them. A lot of times they don't. The, the, the weight person, they, they don't know how to respond. Well, I don't know. Let me go. Because not many people are doing that. But in Alabama, I believe there's a law that actually says they have to report what it is if you ask them. And and so we need to hold them to it. You know, it's, it's not a seafood committee, but there are a lot of local restaurants uh, that are selling something that's supposed to be catfish. You ask them what it is, and they say it's catfish, but it's an idea that one, one waitress did make a mistake one time and tell me that it was pangaceous. Pangaceous or and I looked it up. There is a pangaea. There's an Asian uh -huh. fish, and uh, the way they raise it is nasty. Oh, it's sewage, all kinds of stuff. People here above it and think they're eating catfish, and they're not. Right. It's terrible. Yeah. I think a lot of uh, restaurants have done that with well, some particular have, fishes, like maybe know, grouper or something. There's trying to pass off any white fish. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, we used to have to, uh, restaurant, we used to have to have a certificate saying this is farm raised catfish, Alabama, or whatever. But now I think the legislature has done away with that, and now they don't have to tell you where this supposed catfish is from. Mm -hmm. I've never been there, but I've always been free about the Boat. Oh, but right. Um, are there tourist facilities? Huh. Well, that that'd be a great thing and something that I've sort of envisioned for the waterfront, but there really there really is not. Um, there's not a boardwalk for people to go out and kind of get closer and out on the bayou. That's certainly, those are certainly discussions that, that people have. You know, we've talked about things like um, a shrimp boat that would be parked on the bayou that would have the, the decking and boardwalk around it so people could come and even get on the boat and learn about, you know, how it's done and all of that. Um, but there's not that right now. Um, and there's not that for sure, <laughs> but there, uh, Dauphin Island is not too far off, and and there's often places to stay there, um, and then you can explore the entire Mobile County coast and and all of those com communities that I mentioned. Um, it's pretty cool to just drive through there and, and see people's boats out in the yard and the and the nets up drying in net makers yards and things like that. Um, it's pretty neat stuff. Mm. Yeah. So I'm 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 thinking they must be connecting from um, East Fowl River, coming through the Narrows, and and probably going down into West Fowl River where their homes are. say so and, and I wouldn't see them as kind of I mean yes those those early canning factories um, were big operations you know and I think even some of them started by people coming from Maryland 
um, you know, from the Chesapeake Bay area. Um, but those later, like, the fleet um, operations for shrimping, they were done by, you know, other. they were generally generational folks who started those companies. You know, so the people who ran the boats, they were friends with the owners. Um, yeah, so it didn't create a huge divide. Well, I'm not sure if that reef completely disappeared. Um, I know that it's not a reef that is actively fished, but I'm not sure that it ever was because of this knowledge about it being, you know, a mother reef. Um, but I do know that for a lot of people after that, you know, oystering was no longer as viable as it once had been that it did affect the reefs throughout that they do harvest from. What about the uh, pollution, the uh, Mobile Bay, uh, the mercury maybe, the primary, is that still a problem? Hmm. That I am not sure of. Um, the other issue that I know that has affected the bay um, from the, the, you know, fishers I've spoken with is the, the causeway being put in. When the causeway was put in in the 20s, it didn't have a lot of open points. And it used to be where they'd get these big rains that would come and flush out the bay. And that doesn't happen anymore. And so that has affected a lot of things in the bay. Um, not being able to trawl in certain areas. I've heard about not being able to trawl in Weeks Bay affecting the resources there. Because in fact, it's like when you, when you go across the bottom, you're aerating and stimulating things that doesn't happen now. So it becomes kind of like a dead bottom. And those are things that are being regulated for environmental you know, that particular thing for environmental reasons, and it's causing issues that scientists don't quite grasp. <laughs> Well, I would just sum that up to mean, you know, to be that it's the native folks who were coming down seasonally to harvest the resources. That mound and many mounds in that area um, were from those activities. Those areas being used for hundreds and thousands of years for that purpose and then the piling of the shell. It seems unusual that it's still so large. Mm hmm yeah, well, it goes back a long, a long time. <laughs>